this uh, rock pocket mouse. This one is a bit more involved. Again, we got some introduction. This information uh, I discuss in the, the end of the mutations video, that pre-lab part that starts around like the 12 minute mark. And then you just got some pre-lab questions, all these information between the video and this two paragraph up here. You should not be Googling any of this. Do not Google any of this. The answers are right here. If you Google, I will know because it'll be very clear that you've got weird answers. Get them from up here. Next, we've got a laundry list of procedures and at first it looks very intimidating. Again, this is something that would take like two or three class periods. So for the most part, if you, um, if you do the first page one day and then work through like the first couple, let's say one, one and two, one, two and three, maybe one and two, and then you can do these ones, and then you've got some conclusion questions. You have to work through all these before you can start doing the conclusion questions. The part that gets weird is already they're talking about DNA in a gene table. That's this right here. So the MC1R gene, which is the gene that we're going to talk about here, the uh, uh, whatever it stands for. Metlacortine 1. It's a, it's a long gene. They've actually just broken it down into sections. And so you can actually see the numbers up here, uh, that little 15 on your paper. That 15, that actually corresponds to this is the 15th amino acid in the protein. If we go to the very last page, you can actually see right here this sucker. This is the whole MC1R protein. Right, and you can see you've got a cytoplasm, so this part is inside the cell, this part is outside the cell, and here are all the points where it goes across the cell membrane. Remember your whole polar nonpolar, so in here, this part of the protein needs to be nonpolar so that it can hang out with the tails. These two parts, inside the cell and outside the cell, they both need to be polar so that it can be outside of the cell. But right here, see the first one start? That's that's a met, right? M for metinine. But you go uh, like right here, 18, 17, 16, 15, right here. This is that 15th amino acid. That's the first one on the table. So you don't have the whole gene. That would be crazy. You're just going to do different parts of the genes. You've got one, uh, uh, different domains. And so you'll notice, right, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, et cetera, domains. And so they're labeled over here. Mostly you just should be thinking extracellular. Remember that's outside the cell. Intracellular, that would be inside the cell. So if it says intracellular, you should be looking at a part of the protein here. If it says extracellular, you should be looking at a part of the protein here. And if it says transmembrane, like it does right over here, right? Transmembrane then you should be looking at a part that is within the membrane, in between the two membranes. So just like you just did on the worksheet before, right here, they've already set your reading frame for you. You're welcome. You're just going to go through here and do transcription, right? Do your base pairs, right? A, T gets an A, T gets an A, G gets a C. Then you'll go through and you'll use uh, the codon wheel, or you can use the table if you like the table better. You'll do translation, so AAC, that would be AAC, that's a, yeah, asparagine, right? As you go through here, you'll notice that on the protein, that N, that's for asparagine for some reason, the one letter abbreviation is N, but whatever. You go through do transcription translation. Then you're going to look at the uh, mutant versus the wild type. And so here in each of these sections, they give you the wild type. This is what we suspect is the OG version. And they give you the mutant. This is what we expect is the mutant version. Again, you can't always tell. Uh, usually we go with the one that it seems more... Uh, 
more rare in the environment, assuming there hasn't been a big environmental change. We'll talk more about uh, genes and their play in evolution a little bit later. But you got the wild type and mutant section for each of these genes. So here's one part, wild type gene, mutant gene. Here's another part, wild type gene, mutant gene. You're just going to compare them, right, like it says right here. It's going to compare them. And then you're going to find the places where there's a mutation. They're giving you these sections because there are one, two, three, four, five mutations in the MC1R gene that actually uh, cause the difference between the wild type and the mutant. Five mutations. They've somewhere in this section. Something here is different from something here. And those of you who are eagle eyeing it have probably already found right there. We got we got a snip point mutation. So you're just going to go through, you'll compare the DNA and the wild type and the mutant and, and you, you're just you're just going to circle, if it's a SNP, circle it. I'll give you a hint, they're, they're going to be there, uh, well there, there might be some insertions or deletions and then you'll see like a big shifty looking something or other. Um, it'll be easy to tell. So you'll go through and then right in here, you're just gonna, you're gonna count them up. So after you circle the nucleotide that's changed, see I just circled the nucleotide that's changed in the mutant. You'll come through here and you'll count up how many times do we have a substitution, also known as a SNP. How many times is there an insertion or a deletion? Now because we do, uh, we do suspect that one version is a wild type versus the mutant, we can't actually distinguish between an insertion and a deletion. We don't just have to lump them in as indels. And you'll just count up how many. Remember, it should equal five. If the number that you wrote here does not equal five, then something has gone horribly wrong. Yes, it's three points because there's three types of mutations, but there's five mutations total. Then you'll go through those five mutations that you found in the DNA. You're going to determine, is it a silent mutation? Is it a missense mutation? Or is it a nonsense mutation? Count them up. Then color code them color code them. If you've got crayons or markers or fun sharpies and pens and stuff at home, you're just going to color in the whole block. So this whole block right here, this whole block, we're just going to color it in lightly uh, based on if it is a silent mutation, we'd color this whole block blue. If it's a missense mutation, we color the whole block red. If it's a nonsense mutation, we color the whole block green. Give you a hint. Nonsense mutation is not going to make a even close to functional MC1R, so hopefully we don't see any of those. You'll go through, you'll identify which region they are found in. Again, those are labeled for you on the side of the gene table. Don't forget about this side of the gene table. So you've gone through here, you've circled the nucleotide that's different, you've color coded the whole box. Then you're going to come to the back side. You're going to do a little counting. You will find, for example, um, this one right here. This first mutation, 15, 16, 17. This is in the 18th. So this one right here, 18. This amino acid right here, that's a mutation. You don't have to do the M and stuff, but you're going to color code this to match what you put here in the box. So for example, let's say you said that this was a silent mutation. You colored it blue then you color that one blue as well. You sort of go through and you can snee, you can you can snee. You can see that it sort of snakes back and forth, right? There's 44, 45, 46, right? So it's sort of snaky snaky. Don't get too concerned like with the transmembrane one finding it. You know, just you've got some markers. They go in order 230, 231, 232, 233, so on and so forth. Again, the start of each gene table is labeled with a number so you know about where you're looking like 230 right that's right here that's right here in our protein so you'll know where to look you'll color those in which is what it says to do right here step six you'll color them in on the diagram well it's six and seven and then number eight you're going to discuss why uh, the mutations being where they are and the type of mutation they are missense nonsense or silent being in the portion why it matters here's where you have to remember that this is a receptor protein its job is to get signals from outside the cell change some shape through here and send a signal on the inside of the cell 
So based on some stimulus that this protein receives out here, it's going to do some stuff and then it's going to send a signal on the inside of the cell. That signal is going to control how much of these two proteins, the pheomelanin and the eumelanin, get made. This is what we call a HOX or a toolkit gene because this is one gene that controls a whole myriad, right? We're controlling two different genes downstream. Both of these, uh, the wild type and the mutant rock pocket mice, have the same pheomelanin gene and the same eumelanin gene. What's different is this receptor protein. So you're going to discuss why the mutations being in the part of the protein they are, why that would matter based on the function of a receptor protein in general. That's a lot. I know this was a pretty long explanation. Uh, pace yourself. It's, it's designed to take you a few days to complete. Okay, so you don't feel like you've got to grind this whole thing out by Wednesday take your time with it but you know if you're you got hitting a good stride and your YouTube videos are loading too slowly go to town if you have any questions as always holler at me thanks everyone uh, I still miss you all and the longer I don't get to see you uh, the weirder and weirder this becomes for me so hopefully we can come back uh, in May <laughs>